Um, as you can see, this is going to be an interview uh, with Eska Hayek. Eska Hayek's father-in-law was Friedrich Hayek, who is, uh, gives his name to this hall. Um, he was a great economist, uh, a great friend of the cause. I suspect most of you have read his great work, which was The Road to Serfdom. Uh, this chat is going to be quite light-hearted, anecdotal, uh, less more about ideas and more about the person that was Friedrich Hayek and why he means so much to our movement. So, let's start. Uh, I, uh, I, I hope, first of all, you can tell me how you uh, met uh, your husband and when you first met his father. Uh, well, um, I was a nurse at the Middlesex Hospital and my husband was in his first clinical year as a medical student. And we met, uh, well, on the ward, <coughs> and um, he looked at me, uh, or benched to see my name, and asked me if I would, perhaps as I got a week off, would I like to go out to dinner one night? Which I did, and I told my parents, that one of the students, and they said, what's his name? And I said, I don't know, he knew. He knew my name from looking at the notes, but I didn't know his. My father told gave me a right telling off. And we went out to dinner and I didn't see him again for a year. And then we met walking through the hospital. And um, we chatted and he said he was going for a weekend um, sailing with the United Hospital Sailing Club. Why don't you come? I'm going with a crowd. So I said, oh, yes, fine, I'd love to come. And then he had to rush back to the medical school to rustle up the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we were engaged the following year and we were married in 1961. And um, I knew nothing about economics. I knew nothing about his father. Um, we met when we were engaged. I met his father, he'd come to London. And um, he came to the wedding. And, oh, that's interesting because um, he and Diana Robbins had years and years before slightly fallen out over their ideas. Now I'm not tending to be slightly more left wing, I think father's very right wing. <coughs> and they haven't spoken for years. Mm -hmm. And they met at our wedding, resumed their friendship to the end of their lives which was absolutely marvellous. I've got a lovely photograph of Ram and father deep in conversation together. And um, my father actually did remark to me that he just heard that um, my father had written a book. Well, and that book, of course, was... Road to Serfdom. Which today we have the uh, handwritten copy of the Road to Serfdom. Um, I was hoping uh, if you could just read the, uh, the inscription uh, on the front, oh, on the first page. Um, this is in an ordinary child's exercise book, in lines. It's entitled The Road to Serfdom, and it said, This is about the third or fourth draft, rewritten from a longer transcript, later destroyed by mistake, in an endeavour to shorten it, if I remember rightly, in the course of 1942. And on the oh, first yes. page? Um, B. Hume said, It is seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. And um, de Tocqueville said, I would have loved freedom, I believe, at all times, and in the time in which we live, I am really, I really worship it. I think we could all agree with. Uh, it's quite interesting as well, uh, the, the first page where it says, to the socialists in all parties, which oh, is... Oh yes, uh, that's, uh, that's something on the inside. That is the dedication, and the dedication is to the socialists of all parties. <laughs> which is something which still happens today. Uh, can you tell us what um, brought uh, Hayek over to the UK, um, not Austria? Oh yes. Um, it was at a time, it was in 1931, and Keynes was very much in the ascendant at the London School of Economics. And um, he was a person who, of enormous personality, and um, 
Lauren Robbins, who was director of the LSD at the time, felt that his ideas were taking root in the LSE. And he read the road to Southampton and he thought, that is the person to balance canes. And so he invited, he was um, invited for a year to lecture on what was called the Tube Fellowship. And he stayed a year and then he was invited to stay on and on until um, after the war he went to America. And while at the London School of Economics, she had a very famous rivalry, probably the most famous rivalry in all of academia with Keynes. Keynes. Yes, um, absolutely. But is it true that he was actually great friends with oh, Keynes? Oh yes, they were friends. They far watched together on the roof of King's College, Cambridge, when, because um, London School of Economics was evacuated, and it was evacuated to Peterhouse. Keynes was um, in King's. But he got Father Diamond Light to King's and um, an entree to King's, so hence they followed together. And um, I'd love to have heard their discussions on the roof of King's College Cambridge. <laughs> so did, did he respect him as an academic then? Oh yes, very much so. Because, um, well you know the story that is actually said to be a myth, but it's not because Father told me himself that um, Keynes was being listened to because he was a very charismatic person and um, could put things over and people listened to him, whereas father was quiet and rather shy and everybody was listening to Keynes. And father said to Keynes, look, everybody's listening to you, but supposing it's found that your ideas don't work, what then? And Keynes said, well, you say everybody listens to me, I shall simply persuade them your way. But Keynes died six weeks after that conversation. If Keynes had lived longer, yes, you don't know what would have happened. What would have happened? Well, yeah. and of course, a lot of Hayek's uh, ideas and writings were rejected at the time. Uh, and when oh, Road, yes. and when Road to Serfdom came out, it wasn't very warmly received in this country. No. How did he feel about that at the time? He was <sighs> depressed. <coughs> Right. He, he, was, he was actually depressed for a long time, <coughs> and um, I may say, talking about the road to serfdom, and if he was interested, I don't know if you know that in recent years, Amazon has sold 100,000 copies. It's um, never come out of print, is it? No, no, no. Was the reason that his lack of success originally in this country the reason why he went to the United States? Because um, it was very successful over there. No, he, he went to the United States because he was invited to, um, to lecture. Mm -hmm. And um, then he was offered a lectureship there and he stayed. And um, I say he stayed in the for personal reasons. <coughs> so, was he... How did he cope with that rejection? Because um, one of his biographers uh, said, uh, described him as being dismissed, ridiculed, and ignored for probably most of the 50s, 60s. Um, how do, uh, academics wouldn't even meet with him. How, how, how did he cope with that? Well, I don't know, because I only saw him at home, you see. Um, <laughs> he absolutely loved coming to stay with us. Um, in fact, I can remember him coming once and the taxi dropped him and I opened the front door and he said, I'm home. And of course when his own children were little, he was um, writing all the time. My husband said that um, we always had to be quiet because father was writing. And so when the grandchildren came along, he was absolutely thrilled. He absolutely adored the grandchildren. In 1974, this all changed uh, yes. when you got a phone call. What happened? Well, I answered the phone, and it was Lionel Robbins, and um, he said, Eska, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. He said, I've got something to tell you. Your father-in-law has been awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, and it was the first Nobel Prize to be given in Economics. And, um, well, we went to Sweden for 
um, the Bell Week, and um, it was the most amazing week because Solzhenitsyn had just been expelled from Russia. He had previously been awarded the Nobel Prize, but this was the first time that he was able to come and um, receive it. So, Hayek uh, and Solzhenitsyn, and I was very privileged because I was standing quite near Solzhenitsyn um, at a, uh, after the Nobel Prize giving, and I said to one of the interpreters, may I speak to him? And the interpreter was absolutely marvellous. He spoke into his ear and he spoke into um, my ear, but it was as if we were actually talking directly to each other. And he held onto my hand all the time while he was talking to me. And I'll never forget that. It was just incredible. So. Um, A year after that, uh, Margaret Thatcher got elected as leader of the Conservative Party and uh, as, a, as a young girl at Oxford, Margaret Roberts, mm. she read The Road to Serfdom yes. and it was around the Shadow Cabinet in the 70s that she famously slammed down the Constitution of Liberty and said, this is what we believe. Yes. Um, yeah. Did he admire Margaret Thatcher and what she achieved? Mm. Did he admire oh, Margaret Thatcher? Very, she very much. He was thrilled with it because we were going down the path of socialism until Margaret Thatcher arrived. and. Um, he admired her tremendously, and I did actually remark to him about her reading his books and quoting him, and he said, yes dear, she's very selective, you know. <laughs> and he also came to know a US president, Ronald Reagan. Yes. yes um, what, did, what did he say about Ronald Reagan then? <coughs> I really can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, you see, when we were staying with us, yes. It was home and family and the children and the ponies and the dogs and the cats. He adored the cats. The cats always used to sit on his lap. And um, I think he admired him and he was relieved that he was going down that path, the path to freedom. Um, and in a way turning that idea in America, turning America around as he, as he was it as he was in England. I'm sorry, can you can hear me but I can't he described. And what did Margaret Thatcher uh, make of him? Because I know that you were telling me the amount of letters you've got from Margaret Thatcher to him a few. Um I've got what have I got? I've got a very moving woman when he died. And um, I, can't. There's the, um, I remember seeing the documentary Masters of Men, yes. and there was the one letter in there on his 90th birthday, oh, yes, which was right. very, yes, very nice. Yes, yes, that's right. That was what I was thinking of on his 90th birthday, a lovely, lovely letter, and um, saying about you know how, how quite we could do without your ideas, and that he was crucial to what mm. happened in this country. Oh, absolutely, yes. You you were telling me outside as well uh, that you he used when. You, he used to come visit you, and he used to explain economics to you around the kitchen table. Yeah. Well, um, you see, the thing was, everybody was on about the market, the free market, and everybody was on about it. I knew nothing whatsoever about it, economics. And one day I said to him, look, you know, everybody's on about the free market. Why is the market important? And he said to me, my dear, Unlike governments, the market has all the information. <coughs> yes, mm -hmm. thinking that out, and the freer the market, the more the information can work. So, uh, when he died in 1992, you said you finally realised how influential oh. he was, uh, and you said to me it was completely because you were told to do something because your husband was away. Yes. Uh, no, well, my husband actually got probably got the train uh, to go to Freiburg, you see, because uh, he was, that's when he died. And I was left with the telephone. I spoke to John Bundell, who said, had I told Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan, um, well, no, I haven't, uh, <laughs> things like that. And I think I spent the night on the phone to the world. I had, it was only that time that I really realized or began to realise his influence on the world. Because at home he'd just been 
father and to the children. Well, the children, they call my, my father grandpa. And um, my father-in-law was known as the Austrian Opa. So, and he was, when he was staying with us, he was just Opa. They had the children and the dogs and the cats. And so, you know, I didn't really... Um, we, we chatted around, um, as they sat in the kitchen and I talked about the economics. Uh, but not economics, I mean, it sounded to me just some good sense about, you know, shopping, really. <laughs> and you, of course, around that kitchen table introduced into a newspaper. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, we always took the Telegraph. And uh, he hadn't seen it before. And uh, he was immersed in the Telegraph every day when it came. And he said, I've seen that before. He said, but he said, you know, my dear, it's a very biased paper. <laughs> <laughs> he was very lucky to live a very long life. And uh, in 1989, three years before he died, he saw the collapse of the Berlin Wall, which, mm. in fact, is yeah. the 25th anniversary this year. Mm. Did he see a vindication? Was, was that a vindication of everything he had said and wrote? I don't know. You're probably... You know probably more about his works and his writings and, and everything than I do. Um, I can't answer that really because I wouldn't, didn't discuss it with him. You know. Why do you think young people like me and like people in this audience are still interested in his ideas? Um, well, I think they're, they're forward looking. Um, I think basically they're young ideas. There's uh, something that one can take hold of and, and run with. And he was particularly anxious that the word should be spread among young people. And um, that's one of the things he was very thrilled with the IEA, um, with their, um, the way they had young people to the IEA and included them. And he said to me, it's of utmost importance that my ideas and these ideas are spread to young people because they will then take them forward. <clears throat> His lifespan was from 19... He was born in the 19th century, wasn't he? He was, 18, he was, born, he was one year older than the, than the year. He was born in um, 1899. Um, and he lived till 1992, so it's a very long lifespan. What, and the 20th century was probably the most change we've ever had in human history. Mm -hmm. What did he make of that massive change throughout his life? Um, I think, in a way, he enjoyed everything that came along, and, and you know, my goodness, this is happening, that's happening. Who would have, who would have thought? I think, you know, um, in a way, he enjoyed it all, and of course, he loved living in England. I mean, he loved coming to England, didn't he? He lived in Freiburg, and we used to go and stay with him there, but. Um, I can remember it was in a time of deep socialism. Harold Wilson, everything was going down. And, um, I, and he, he traveled and lectured all over the world. And I said, you know, where would you live now in the world? Because he's always said he would love to have lived it. He's, he said, I can remember now. He said that his ideal of a life would have been to be an English country squire. <laughs> and I said to him at this awful time, I said, but now that the state the country's in, where would you live? And he said, he even said, nowhere else, if I could. So, no. Uh, very touching. Um, one of the great inventions of the 20th century was, of course, television. And <laughs> your husband introduced into a particular television program, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, Minister. Uh, <laughs> he absolutely loved it. He was glued to it. He never, he never watched television except for the news. But we put this on, and because we always watched it. And he just loved it. And. Um, no, it was his programme. Yeah. <laughs> Milton Friedman said of him, there is no figure who had more of an influence. No person had more of an influence on the intellectuals behind the Iron Curtain than Friedrich Hayek. 
His books were translated and published by the underground and black market editions, read widely and undoubtedly influenced the climate of opinion that ultimately brought about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Did you realise how influential he was in his own lifetime? I think, I don't think he, he realised like that. I think he hoped. He hoped. And, um, well, I suppose it must have been when they started, when they first published one of his books in, um, in Russia. And, um, yes, sir. I can't, I, can't, I can't remember exactly when that, when that was. <coughs> I must have been after his death. You said to me that the, uh, the proudest day of his life was uh, happened here in Britain. Can you say what that was? It was um, when he was awarded the Companion of Honour by the Queen. And um, I said to him, oh my goodness, Father, you're going to meet the Queen, aren't you thrilled? And he said, my dear, I have met so many heads of state. It's just a head of state. <laughs> <laughs> and when he came out, he was transformed. He said he had no idea of her knowledge. And um, when you get something out of CH, you're not just presented with it, you have a 20 minute audience. 20 minutes talking to the Queen, the Queen talking to you, it's a long time. And he was told to stand outside the door and bow, step over the, <coughs> um, step into the room and bow, walk to the Queen, bow again. And then she shook his hand. And then they, she showed him that, and they talked about it also, how attractive it is. And um, then, then she said, now, now, do sit down. That's the, um, that is the actual companion of mine. Which we'll put on the table we'll afterwards. Put on, we'll put on the table, and you can, you can see it afterwards. Um, it says, Companion of Honour, presented by Queen Elizabeth II, back in Paris, 1984. But when he came out, he said he was absolutely amazed at her knowledge, her knowledge of the state of the finances, the economic state of the country. And he couldn't understand that. But of course, she meets the Prime Minister every week. And so <coughs> she is probably the person who knows most about what is going on in the country at the time. But he was amazed at the conversation that they had in, in, in depth on um, English economics and the state of the country. Before I open up questions to you, uh, I just wanted to share two anecdotes which we often tell at the Institute of Economic Affairs where I work and where Friedrich Hayek helped set it up. And what happened was Sir Anthony Fisher read The Road to Serfdom uh, who's our founder, and he thought, this is, this is brilliant, this is everything I believe in. And, he re and then he found out that uh, Friedrich von Hayek worked at the LSE, the London School of Economics. So he wrote to him and said, please will you meet with me, please will you meet with me? And uh, he said, okay, I'll meet with you. And they had a meeting, and Anthony Fisher said, I'm going to go into politics, I'm going to become a member of parliament, put all of these into action. He said, no dear boy, don't go into politics. <laughs> He said, you won't you do, do anything. Yeah, you, won't, you won't do anything in politics. He said, you need to change public opinion. You need to change the thought of the intellectuals and the people and journalists and students. And that is what the Institute of Economic Affairs still tries to do today. I think we, we do it with uh, some reasonable success. Yes. Um, and the other one which uh, John Blundell told me actually was they, when they set up a meeting. Mark, Mark Thatcher knew obviously that we were set up with Hayek and she wanted a meeting. So we arranged a meeting for her to come to the IEA. She came to the IEA, sat in one of our rooms, and then Hayek came in, and she asked him a question, and then she just let him talk, and talk, and talk. And he talked for 30 minutes, and she said nothing. And uh, one, of, one, of the mem one of the members of the IEA turned around to me and said, She's, she was never, uh, she was, she had never been that quiet in all of her life. <laughs> 30 minutes of silence from Margaret Thatcher. Um, so that was uh, pretty impressive on uh, Hayek's part. Um, I'm not going to open up to questions from any of you, so yeah, Sam Bowen. Um, hi, thanks very much. I really, really enjoyed your, um, your conversation. Um, I always get the impression from Hayek that he gets more radical 
the older he gets. So he seems to be more libertarian and more kind of out there uh, the older he gets. Did you ever get that impression of uh, being around him? I didn't get that impression, um, but I wouldn't disagree with it. But I do know that all people as they get older, and I mean he was seriously old when he died, they do actually get more and more fixed in their thoughts. So perhaps he, you know, that, that, that is that what you picked up. Yes, um, could you throw some light on who actually had the Nobel Institute or Corporation? Sorry, Speak up a little bit. Sorry, could you throw some light on who actually was the influences who actually gave... I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. slightly deaf, I'm sorry, sorry. Can, can you throw some light on who actually, uh, at the Nobel Foundation, actually gave uh, you know, the award to uh, Frederick von Hayek? You know, it seemed like out of character compared with what they're doing today, giving these prizes to President Obama, etc. So who was it? Who were the characters? You mean who was behind him getting it? Who were the people there? Um, did you know that Gunnar Myrdal was given one as well? Um, well, it's the um, Nobel Committee. Were, he was given it for his writing on monetary theory, not on economics or or his writing, on his writings on monetary theory. <laughs> and um, they also gave the uh, a share, the sh other half the share of it, to Gunnar Myrdal, who was a left-wing Swedish writer, because they felt that just having Hayek wouldn't have gone down very well in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, the question I wanted to ask as well is, uh, we've talked a lot this weekend actually on the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, I wondered if, if, if you knew what his thoughts were on the European Union and what you think he'd make of the European Union now. He wasn't, I don't think he would be happy about the European Union and his thoughts now, we're in it, that we should come out, I think. Yeah. I, think I think a lot of people in this room would share that view yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that is, I'm quite, quite sure that's what his thoughts would be. <coughs> I'm not sure if you're aware of some of the videos on the internet that have been up there uh, in a well-meaning joke uh, approach to pro propagating the views and ideas of Hayek. One of them is a rap video starring him and Keynes together rapping yes. each other. I guess you're not familiar with these. I just, I'm uh, terribly and, sorry. Uh, another I, one, I, is, uh, is, is, one is a love song by a 20-year-old girl saying how much she loves Hayek. Um, but I was just wondering if, if you were aware of them, perhaps now that you, you know about them, what do you think he would have thought about them? They're very, they very good faith, they're funny. I think he'd be quietly yeah. amused. <laughs> but quite pleased that um, he was well enough known, and his ideas were well enough known to be used like that. I think the fact that he's, not exactly just he himself, because he, he, it was his ideas that were important, not he himself. Mm -hmm. That, that was very obvious, actually, when you met him. He was very quiet. And, but it was the ideas. And so. Hi. I, thank you so much for today. It's been so interesting to listen to you. What did he do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> he worked. <laughs> and played with the children. When he, he only, he lived in Freiburg. And, um, Actually, he's got, we've got a lovely photograph, because he sat, he had a lovely study um, with a, a window overlooking the road, with trees and a tree line road. And he sat in his armchair, and above him was an enormous uh, picture of Churchill. And um, for fun, well, when he stayed with me, we used to walk and talk, and he used to take us out for meals, and um, he used to read to the children, and they were pretty small. And of course, I don't know if you know, but ch small children like the same story over and over and over, and he got a little tired of my five-year-old saying, Oh, Pa, again, oh, Pa, again. Finally, he went upstairs. I'm just going upstairs. <laughs> um, what what um, are your recollections of uh, Friedrich with regards to Ludwig von Mises? Um, 
I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I only know him. Uh, I mean, I know all all music, but I yeah. Oh yeah. He was his teacher uh, oh, in Austria. That's right. Of course yeah. he was. And um, set him on the on the road to the uh, the Institute of um, Austrian Cycle, the Business Cycle. Uh, yes. Uh, what's it called? And um, I suppose we had um, a barber here for many years. I don't know if I expect we should put it somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I haven't thought about him for many a long year. Yes. So, uh, Talking about your books, how, how, much, how much work have you got of his? Because I imagine you've used okay. a hell of a lot. Masses. <laughs> the house is full. Because every time a book is published in any, any language, we get a copy. So I've got like, um, many, many languages, especially I may say Japanese. So, well, we had a call this week from the, uh, somebody in Japan who said we were going to produce the Road to Surf in Japanese. Uh, mm. So that would be another one to add to your collection. Uh, yes. <laughs> to your delight. <coughs> um, before I put these, we're going to put them on uh, the there's the family photos, the original Road to Serfdom, and the Companion of Honor Medal. We're going to put them on the back, or maybe on this, put it on the back so you can all go over and have a look uh, at them. Please don't touch the book, but, um, because obviously it's very fragile, but feel free to take photos. Um, I just wanted to ask what you think you'd make of this type of weekend of us libertarians getting together and discussing ideas. Uh, he would be thrilled a bit. <laughs> I mean, he would be actually delighted at the um, age range. Yes. Well, um, Esther's going to be around till this evening, you're coming to dinner, so feel free to come and speak to her and we're going to put the memorabilia on the back so you can have a look at it and take photos and feel free to chat to Esther. So, thank you. Thank you.